morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday Minor Prophet Study. We're in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 6 is what we're covering today. Let's have ourselves a prayer and we'll get started. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for everything. Father, we pray that you be with our country, that you be with the divisiveness that's in the world and that you help us as individuals, Father, to learn how to act decently and properly. We pray that you be with all of our political figures who are trying to do their best at uh, serving the country, and we pray that you help us to be able to uh, serve you. Uh, we ask, Father, that uh, you help us understand that your kingdom is not the government of this world, but is, in fact, your son Jesus who rules in our hearts. And so we pray, Father, that no matter what happens in our world, that we might stay faithful to the true king. And we pray that you help us to always glorify you and honor you. We're thankful for Hosea and the prophets that wrote so that we might know how you work in our world. And we praise you and thank you for all things and ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, so we are in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 6. And as we're getting into here, if you, if you can look at your, uh, at your little booklet there, at the outline that you have, and I'm not sure what page that's on, and mine is page uh, 37 uh, of Hosea. And as, as you look at it, we're in this section beginning in chap- chapter 5, and it, ha- it has to do with the judgment on Israel and uh, maybe some restoration of Israel as, we, as we're looking at this. So we're in verse, in verse 6, and what we've noticed is that God is bringing judgment on Israel and so beginning in Hosea 5 and verse 6, it says, they will, uh, they will go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. Uh, he has withdrawn from them. That, that reminds us of, of uh, some of the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 28 says, Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. There is a time when God finally says, that's enough. He's, he, you might say he's fed up or he's reached his limit, and therefore he's not going to bring uh, blessings on them because they're not doing what they're supposed to do, and he's warned them and told them over and over, and so he withdraws from them. In verse 7, he says, They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have borne illegitimate children. Now the new moon will devour them and uh, with their land. Now, this idea of uh, they dealt treacherously against the Lord is the idea that that they're not doing what God says, so he's dealing treacherously with them, and he says they they have born illegitimate children. In other words, the people of Israel that are supposed to be faithful to God, they're not faithful to God. They're not serving God like like they ought to serve God. And so rather than Israel being a nation that promotes righteous righteousness in their citizens, Israel is a nation that has caused their citizens to go astray. And that's what he means here by born of illegitimate children. It certainly could be speaking about the fact that sometimes they intermarried with, with uh, other nations, but more than likely it's talking uh, about them, them and their spiritual relationship uh, with the idols, and therefore they, they bear children that are following the idols instead of following God. And when he talks about the fact that now the new moon will devour them uh, with their land, that's an expression that says when, when God brings upon them this new this new beginning, you might say, that this new beginning is going to be destruction. God's going to bring destruction upon them uh, uh, when the new moon comes. In, in other words, God is going to, in a, in, in a new moon, he's going to see them, and he's going to come and punish them. And we know that what, what that's talking about is talking about when they go off, Israel, the, the southern tribes go off into Assyrian captivity, and Judah's going to go off into Babylonian captivity. Remember, here's Hosea. He's preaching during this time here, and he's preaching to those individuals, prophesying to them about what's going to happen to them. And so uh, he says, the new moon will devour them, Verse five, or, uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Blow the horn in, in, in uh, Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, sound an alarm at beth Avon behind you, Benjamin. Now he's talking about the land, and he's talking about that right, let me find a map here, that right here is Benjamin. And the idea is that if Benjamin turns around and looks, Ephraim and this area up here is is being invaded by by Assyria. Remember that Assyria is going to be the first group that comes against Israel over here, the ten northern tribes. And so it's kind of like uh, the prophet is telling Benjamin, look behind you because they're catching up on you. They're they're getting close to you. 
and, and they're going to overtake you. Verse five, verse nine, he says, Ephraim will become a desolation in the, in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. And so what he's telling them is that, like our, our little um, chart shows here, the, the rule of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, their king is going to end when Assyria comes and destroys them. And God is saying it will come. Now, Hosea is preaching during this time. And so for, for Hosea, it's something that's going to happen in the future. But he's telling them it is going to happen. You can count on it. It's, go, it's going to happen. I declared it. It's sure to come. And so the idea is maybe they're, maybe they're false gods say things and they don't come to pass. But when God says something, it's going to come to pass. So if God says they're going to go off into captivity, they're going off into captivity, and their land is going to be left desolate. And that, that's what he refers to here uh, when he says Ephraim will become a d desolation in the day of rebuke. Now, Ephraim isn't just the tribe Ephraim right here. here here's uh, Ephraim right here. It's not the, just the tribe Ephraim. It represents all of this area up here. This area up here is known as Ephraim or Israel. So he's not just talking about Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. He's talking about the, the whole northern or the, the, yeah, the whole northern kingdom is what he's referring to when he says they're going to become desolate. And when he says desolate, what he's talking about is Israel isn't going to live there. There's going to be people that live there, but they're not going to be Israel. So it's going to be desolate of God's people is what he's referring to. Because if you remember when Assyria came and took them captive, uh, and Assyria did that. Let's see if I have another map up here. I'm thinking of a different note. I don't. Yeah, when Assyria comes and takes them captive, Assyria sends, uh, from up here, Assyria sends their people to live down here in the land of, of Ephraim, in the land of, of the, the northern kingdom. When they take their people up here captive and they bring them to live up here in these areas, they take their people, Assyria, and they go live in the land. So when he says desolate, he doesn't mean it's not going to have any people, but it means it's not going to have God's people there. Do you remember when Jesus came down with, uh, from uh, Galilee and he went through, through Samaria? Who did he talk with? A woman. The woman at the well. See, there were people there, but they weren't really God's people. Uh, although Jesus was showing us that he can, he can heal them and take care of them just like he can the Jewish community. And so when it talks about Ephraim being desolate, it's not talking about that there's no life there, there's no, there's, the, their land becomes like the Sahara Desert, just you know nothing there. He's talking about in relationship to Israel and his crop. His crop is supposed to be a crop of good people. Now verse 10. He says, The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary. Uh, on them I will pour out my wrath uh, like water. Wait, when God first gave them the, the law in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 14, he says, You shall not move your neighbor's boundary marker, which the ancients have set in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God gives you to possess. In other words, God gave them territory, right? And how was their, ter how was their boundaries marked? In other words, how, how was their lot marked? They would put a stone. They'd put, here, here's one corner of my property. Here's the other corner of my property. Put one over here, and they put one over here, and they put one over here. Well, if you were the neighbor, and you wanted your property to be bigger, what would you do? You would take their stones, and you would move them that way. And you'd go, oh, look, the stones are there. That means this property's mine. In other words, they're cheaters. They're cheating people. And that's what he means when he says uh, the, the princes of Judah have become like that. Now, now, notice that he's not speaking about Israel at this time. He says the princes of Judah. So Judah is following suit along with them. Judah is starting not to uh, keep the law. And so he's pointing out that even Judah, the prince of Judah, have become like those who move boundaries. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. So God is going to punish Judah if they start doing the same thing that Israel does, the ten northern tribes. Now, verse 11, Ephraim is, uh, is oppressed crushed in judgment because he was determined to follow, uh, the New American Standard adds the word man's command. In other words, what, what God is saying is, why is this happening to Ephraim? Is this happening to Ephraim because God isn't strong enough to conquer the Assyrians? No, it's happening to, Eph it's happening to Ephraim, the ten northern tribes, because Ephraim isn't listening to God. 
Remember, as, as we were going through Genesis chapter 1, I tried to get us to understand that this world we live in is just as much spiritual as it is physical. By that, I mean that the spiritual principles of God apply to this world just like the physical principles apply. There's physical principles. If you trip, what are you, what's going to happen to you? You're going to fall down and hit the ground. Well, why? Why does that happen? Because of gravity. See, that's one of the principles of this, uh, of, of this world. Well, one of the other principles is if you don't serve God, you're going to have a bad life. You're, you're not, you're not going to prosper. So that's one of the spiritual principles of this life. But it's just as, much, it's just as important as the, the principle of gravity. Try, try to deny it, and you're going to have trouble. Now, you might say, oh, well, there's some people that don't do what's right, and they seem like they're happy. Yeah, but they're going to get their, the consequences of of their sin some other way. And I would suggest to you they are bearing the consequences of sin. They just got used to it and think that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but anyway, so um, uh, that's what he's talking about here when he says the princes of Judah are like those who move boundaries. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. And so God's going to bring about the Assyrians on, on them and even the Babylonians on Judah when they're not doing what's right. And the same thing will happen to us if we don't do what's right. If you don't do what's right, God, uh, problems are going to be caused in your life. And there, there are spiritual problems that, that's going to be caused in our life. Uh, just ask some guy, for example, who cheated on his wife and she found out. Ask him if he's happy. Hebrew, uh, Hosea 5 verse 11 says, Ephraim is, is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he has determined to follow man's commandments. So that's why that's happening. Now verse 12. Therefore, I am like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. So God says, because they're not listening to me, I'm going to be like a moth. Now, what does a moth do? Does a moth come in and in one day eat all your stuff? How does a moth work? He comes over and eats a little hole in this shirt, and maybe in a couple of days later, he eats a little hole in this shirt and a little hole in that piece of material over there and in that piece over there. And pretty soon you look at all your stuff and it's got holes all over it. And so it's no good, right? Well, that's the way, that's what God's saying. God is saying, I'm going to be a moth to them. Uh, I'm going to come and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to discipline them like, like a moth. He's going to come slowly. He's not going to come all of a sudden and just, it's over. God, every time God does something to Israel and to Judah, and every time something bad happens to them, they ought to say, why is this happening? And they ought to say, it's because we're not doing what God says. But instead, they grow more callous uh, in, their, in their sins and in their wickedness. And that's actually what the Bible says uh, in the book of Ephesians is the problem with us uh, because we live in a world that's full of sin. And so we grow up calloused. And so he, he talks about that over here in Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 17, when he's talking about the difference between the way Christians are supposed to live and the way the world taught us. He says in verse 17, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walked in the futility of their mind. So he said the problem is, is that we were born into the Gentile world and the Gentiles walk according to their futility, the futility of their minds and what they think. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, uh, in them because of the hardness of their heart, and they have become calloused. How does a person get calloused? Tell me how a person gets calluses on their hand. Hard work, okay? It's because you keep, you keep poking at it or you keep hurting it or you keep, you know, if you're digging ditches, your, your, your hands get blisters, and after a while they get calluses, right? So that you don't feel what you're doing anymore. Well, he says that's the way we grew up. We grew up in the Gentile world, and every day the Gentile world is telling us stuff that's making us more callous. So when we hear sin or when we hear some problem, we know oh, that's just the way the world is. And it doesn't bother us. And we become callous. And, and, that's, what, and that's what's happening in the world today. And it's getting worse and worse, which is the reason why some of the laws that have been passed lately in our lifetime, we, we shake our head at and go, really, seriously? The, those are things we're supposed to do now, and people think it's okay? Well, here's what you need to remember. They think it's okay because they, they grew up in a callous world. They grew up in a world where, where they don't have understanding, and they're darkened. And so 
rather than them understanding what's right, they get their, their sense of morality gets picked at and picked at and picked at until they develop a skin over it where it doesn't bother them anymore to do things that they shouldn't be doing. And, and you and I need to remember that because that's what he's talking about over here in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, therefore, I, I'm like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Israel. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wounds, so, so here you go, you're starting to get blisters on your hands. He says, you see these blisters on your hands. He says, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wounds, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob, but he is unable to heal you or to cure you of your wounds. Now, what that's talking about. Well, first of all, let me tell you that there's no king in Assyria named Jerob. The word Jerob or, or the name Jerob means conflict. He's going to the king of conflict. In other words, Judah, uh, in other words, Israel over here is going to, to Assyria and they're going to make some pacts with Assyria, thinking that if they can make a pact with Assyria, then Assyria won't come down and destroy them. It's kind of, it's kind of like sometimes somebody says, well, you know, I, I have to cheat at work. If I don't cheat at work, then I won't make any money. That's what they're doing here. As a nation, they're going to Assyria rather than depending on God. And they're depending on their, on their, on their agreements, their treaties with, with, with the, the, the countries, the, the world powers, Assyria and Babylon. And so they make, these, they make these covenants and treaties with them, thinking that that's going to help them. But in reality, it really doesn't. Uh, and, and so he points, he points that out to them uh, in, in, verse, in verse 13. Uh, in Hosea... 12 and verse 1, we haven't got there yet, but it says, Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. Now, the idea of oil being carried to Egypt is the idea that as, they're, as they see this threat with, with Assyria up here, what they want to do then, I don't know if I have a world map here, what they want to do then is they want to come down here to Egypt. Here's Egypt. So here's Israel right here. Assyria is up here. So once they understand that Assyria is not going to keep his bargain with them, but Assyria is actually going to come down and fight against them, then they run over to Egypt. And they run over to Egypt and they carry money and they carry oil and they carry stuff to Egypt to pay for the protection of Egypt. But, in, but does that help them? No, it doesn't help them. Because like, like I said, this world is more spiritual than we want to give it credit for. In, in 2 Kings 15, 19, it says, Paul, that's P-U-L, king of Assyria, came against the land. And Minham gave Paul a thousand talents of silver so that his hand might, uh, might be with him to strengthen the, king un, the kingdom under his rule. But it didn't work. So instead of, instead of Ephraim turning to God... When they see all these things that are happening, instead of turning to God, what do they turn to? They turn to the nations. They make treaties and covenants. Instead of God, we need to depend on you. It's kind of, it's kind of like today. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you watch any cable television and you watch any, any of those uh, shows that are on there, there's always commercials about medicine. I don't know. Maybe, it's just old, or maybe I'm just old and that's what I focus on. But, but, but a lot of the medicine has to do with if you have AIDS, you can take this and it'll, it'll keep you from, from spreading it instead of telling people, don't do that. What we do is we just provide medicine for them to take care of them so they can continue in, in their immoral activity. But we have this that will help you if you want to continue in your immoral activity. And instead of, a, instead of us seeing our wounds and seeing the problems we're going through and turning to God, we turn to science or we turn to, to uh, uh, other nations or we turn to our army that, and we build it bigger and bigger. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I think we ought to have an army. But the point is we, people depend on the army rather than depending on God. And that's what he's talking about here. And so uh, they, they go to these other, uh, other assets and they aren't cured. It's not the answer. God is always the answer. There's people out in the world who have a giant hole in them, and they're trying to satisfy it with all kinds of different things, with money, with fame, with, with uh, success, with health, with, the, 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 with uh, um, sexual gratification. 
they, they, they try to fill it with all those things, and it never does. Because there's only one thing that will fill that hole, and that's God. But they don't come to God. They stay away from him. In verse in verse five, uh, in Hosea 5 and verse 14, it says, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and, and go away. I will, uh, I will carry away, and there will be none to deliver. Now notice that, that one, two, three, four times, God says, I am doing this. I am doing this. Some people say, well, God would never do anything to punish his people like that. God says, I am doing it. You're going to go off into captivity, not because Assyria is so strong. You're going off into captivity because look at all the wicked kings. Remember that on our chart here, the shaded means they were wicked kings. Look at all the wicked kings you had, and, all, and you guys followed them. And as a result of that, you're going off into captivity. God says, and I am doing it. Instead of them saying, oh, well, God can't help us because we're going off into captivity, they should be saying, well, this is happening because God said it was going to happen. It's kind of, it's kind of like, like your mom and dad disciplining you and, and, and you think somebody else did it. That doesn't make much sense, does it? And that's, it? and that's exactly what's going on here. So he says he's going to be like a lion to them. Okay? Now, verse 15 is an interesting verse because some uh, scholars and commentators believe that it should go with chapter 6. And so maybe it should. But it says in verse 15, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will, uh, uh, they will uh, earnestly seek me. And so he says here in verse 15, I will go away and return to my place. In other words, God's saying, I am leaving you guys. I'm going to leave and go up Go back up to where I live. Have you ever noticed in uh, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 7, you have a, a vision that, that Ezekiel has where he sees the temple and the door opens in the temple and God comes out of the temple? Have you ever noticed that, that vision? If you haven't, read it. Because basically what God is saying is, I'm leaving my house. And so he comes out of his house and he goes up to heaven and he leaves them down there, and he brings destruction on them. If you have, if you have all kinds of dry rot and mold and, and mildew and termites, and, and it's infested your house, what do you do? You leave the house. And, and, and what do you do with your house? If you're planning on living in your house, what do you do with it? You tear it down and start over, don't you? Well, that's what, that's what God's going to do, and that's what he's talking about here when I says, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt. So he says they have to acknowledge their guilt. Remember in Luke, for those of you that are in, in our Luke class, in Luke, Luke uh, uh, Jesus said to them that uh, your judgment is coming on you until you acknowledge, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, they have to acknowledge God. You see, Israel didn't have a king during this time, and God was going to bring them a king, but they weren't doing what God said. So when Jesus came, they rejected him, and Jesus says, you guys aren't going to be blessed until you acknowledge, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's true for us as well. People today aren't going to be blessed by God spiritually unless they acknowledge the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, who came in the name of the Lord? Jesus did. And then he sent his apostles out with the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord, and we follow his word. That's why we study it. That's why we read it. That's why the elders here want your nose where? In the book. We want you guys reading in the book and reading God's word so that you can understand how God functions in the world so we can please him and glorify him and so that we can also see how gracious and merciful and kind he is to us. Look at how long he's been dealing with Israel with wicked kings. Look at that. They started off with wicked kings. None of them were doing what God says, but yet he spent 200 years with them, okay? And, and, and over here with Judah, he, he spent another 120 years afterwards, after Israel fell, with them because God is gracious and kind and merciful. He doesn't want to destroy us. He wants to save us. All right. So, any, any question that far? All right, now, beginning in chapter 6 and verse 1, 
as you read this, you might read it one of two ways. You might read it to say, this is what Israel, this is what God wants Israel to do. And that's one way you can read it. But I don't think that's what he's talking about in this first little section here. I really think what he's talking about is this is Israel. This is, this is God's people. After they see that this calamity coming upon them, after they see that they say, hey, we need to return to the Lord. We need to go back to him. We, we need to get back to God. Okay? So let's read it, and, and you can figure out which one you want to uh, hold to or look at. Chapter Hosea 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day, that we may live before him. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the, as the dawn, and, and, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Now, somebody's saying that. Now, either the people are sincere when they say that, or what's happening is, is they see problems. They, they, they finally see that they're going to be invaded, and so they say, well, maybe we ought to turn to God. Maybe, maybe we ought to turn to him. Because notice what it says in, in verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us up. You see, it sounds like they're depending on God to forgive them and, and, and God to, to restore them and bless them. And so they talk about returning to the Lord. Now, here's what you need to remember. We certainly do need to return to the Lord if you're not doing what's right. Right? Right? You're not doing what's right. You need to return to the Lord. How many people do you know that maybe you've talked to and they were having problems in their life, uh, maybe in their marriage or their family or with drugs or booze or something, they're having problems, and you go talk to them about God and you talk to them about Jesus, and they start coming to church, and then, and then things get better in their life, and then what happens? They leave. You don't see them anymore. Well, see, they were people who were saying, come, let's return to the Lord. He's torn us. We're, we have these problems because we're not doing what God says. But then afterwards, after they get healed, what happens? They, they go back to their old ways because they really didn't repent. They really didn't come back to God. They just didn't want these problems that they were having. And so that's what I suggest he's talking about here, verse 2. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. In other words, our, this punishment, this destruction, isn't going to last a long time. Maybe, maybe two days, maybe three days. He, he's going to save us. Now, one of the interesting things is that when, when Judah, the two southern tribes, went off into Babylonian captivity, that Jeremiah stayed in the land, and Ezekiel went with the people into captivity. So Ezekiel went up here where Babylon exiled the, the uh, Israelites to. He went up, they went up here to... Uh, um, uh, Ezekiel went up here. So Ezekiel is up here with the people. And the book of Ezekiel is written from up here where Jeremiah is written from down here. And Ezekiel up here... One of the things that he, that he, he, he uh, uh, finds out is that there's a guy who's preaching up there. There's a guy who's preaching up there to the people that are in captivity saying, oh, don't worry. You're gonna go, we're going to go right back. Yeah, God was mad at us for a little while. Yeah, and we shouldn't have been doing what we were doing. But we're not going to be here for very long. So let's go back. You know, don't make plans here. Don't make roots. Well, Jeremiah says, build houses. Have your daughters marry. Pray for the country because you're going to be here for 70 years. But there were others that were saying, oh, no, you're just going to be there for a little while. And then afterwards, it's going to be okay. Well, that's what these guys are saying too. If we turn to the Lord, it'll just be for a little bit. It'll be one day, maybe two days, maybe two and a half days. God's going to return to us uh, and, and we'll get to live before him again. Now, verse 3. Here's what they say. So let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. In other words, they say, God will be gracious to us. He, you know, let's return to him, and he'll take care of us. Now, that is true if you honestly, truly repent and turn to God. God will restore to us those things that were taken away. But... If you're just pretending 
or you're just doing it for a little while while you have the pain, God's not a dummy. You can't trick God. You can't pull the wool over God's eyes. And so, how does God respond to their idea of returning to him? This is what you have in verse 4. Look at what he says about their desire to return. He says, what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like the morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. He says, oh, yeah, they might come back. He says, they'll come back for a little while, but they're, they're, they're like the morning dew. If you get up early in the morning, you might see some dew on the ground, right? How long does it stay there? Not very long. Not very long. And you might get up in the morning and there might be a little fog. What happens to the fog? It goes away. He says, that's the way your loyalty is. So if you think that you can just come back for a little while and act like the, uh, act like the fog or act like the dew and I'm going to accept that from you, you misunderstand what it means to be one of my people. And so that's what he's talking about here uh, when he says to them, uh, what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For, you, for your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. He says, therefore... He says, because that's the way it is when you return and you don't return to me fully with your whole heart. He says, therefore, I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgment on you are like the light that goes forth. So God says, because they don't fully return to him, what happens to them? They're going to they're go into captivity, right? Now, remember, God is recording all this and telling us all this for our good. He wants us to understand that that's the, way the, that's the way the spiritual world works. Now, the world might not care. And the world is willing to, to, to just go through life with whatever happens to them, whether it's good or whether it's bad. That's what the world is going to do. But as God's people, we want God's blessings on us. And you have to understand that this is God giving us an example of how you get God's blessings and an example of how you don't get God's blessings. And that's why the world doesn't want you to read the Bible. The world doesn't want you to think that God actually works in our world. They want you to think that God, if, if, if they even think God made you, that God put you here and God's sitting in heaven looking down just to see what we're going to do. He doesn't function in our world. He doesn't do anything in our world. He just looks down on us to see what we're going to do. But everything we've read indicates that God is active in the lives of people. God is active in the lives of nations. God is active in our world because it's a spiritual world as much as it is a physical world. And we need to remember that. And so he says, I hewed them with the prophets. So he sent prophets to them to try to get them repent, but they didn't repent, so fine. He's going to send the prophets, and they're going to talk about the destruction that's coming on them. And it is going to happen. It's going to happen. They're going to see it. Now, why is that going to happen? Look at verse 6. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, what's interesting is Jesus quotes this two times. In Matthew's account, he quotes it in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. And he quotes it in Matthew 12 and verse 7. And in both of those places where he's quoting it, he's quoting it to the religious people of his day that are accusing his disciples of not following the tradition of the elders or not walk, or, or uh, um, taking some grain in their hand and eating it. They are condemning the disciples for what you and I would call uh, ritualistic practices. What they're saying is, you guys aren't doing the religious things the way we do the religious things. Oh, kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like maybe that's what some people we know say about our religious practices. And before we know it, what becomes more important to us is the worship service and whether we get the worship service right. And the worship service has to be right because that's what matters to God is that we get this right. 
That's not why Jesus quoted those. Jesus quoted those because they were, these people that were supposed to be his people were more concerned with ritual practices than they were with the fact that the disciples were hungry, with the fact that they weren't taking care of their mother and their father. Those are the two contexts where, where he mentions these. He, he says, I, I want and I love people to be merciful. Yes. Nope. He talks about our life outside the building. That's right. He talks about how do we treat the poor? How do we treat the people with no clothes? How do we treat the hungry? How do we treat those people that are in need? That's what, that's what God is doing with us. You know why God made us the way he made us? Because we are needy. We're needy people. We can't do anything without God. Try breathing without God giving you air. And if you have air, try breathing without God giving you lungs. And if you have lungs, try breathing without having a system inside your body that carries that around. We can't do anything without God. God is trying to show us how gracious and merciful and kind he is. He didn't have to make us, and he didn't have to take care of us. He says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He says, I want you to know who I am and the fact that I love you and I love people and I want what's best for people and I care about people. Now, does that mean in our religious practice that we just do anything we want? Well, no, we try to do what God says. But that's not what's important. What's important is our loyalty. What's important is our faithfulness. What's important is how do we treat people that are in need and people who need our help like widows and like orphans. And like people who are hungry. How do we treat them? You see, that was the problem with Israel. They had all kinds of religion, but they didn't have God. And so he says, why is this happening to them? He says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. You know what I find interesting in this verse? That God, the creator of the entire world, made an agreement with Adam. He had an agreement with Adam. He made an agreement with him. Adam, I'll take care of you. You do this. But instead, Adam didn't listen. We were talking about Adam today, by the way. Verse 8, he says, Gilead is a city of wrongdoers, tracked with bloody footprints. And as raiders wait for a man, so a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they have committed crime. Now, Micah, or I'm sorry, Malachi, chapter 3, has a long discussion about the priests that were in Israel and that they were more concerned about themselves than, than they were about God's people. But if you look at the priests during Jesus' time here, the high priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, those individuals, uh, what were they trying to do to Jesus? Kill him. They were trying to kill him. You might say, oh, no, this doesn't happen. A, a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem? That, that's what they did over here with Jesus. They tried to kill him. By the way, I think we need to be careful because sometimes I'm afraid we try to spiritually kill people. By telling them they're not good enough. They don't do things right enough. God can't save them because they're not doing everything God says. And some of them quit trying. And we've killed them. Priests aren't supposed to do that. Priests are supposed to encourage people. Priests are supposed to offer sacrifices for people. Priests are supposed to help people get right with God. But that's why Israel's going off into captivity, because as a, as a nation, they were supposed to be God's priests. 
Well, you and I are supposed to be God's priests. You and I are supposed to be the people that represent God in the world. And so verse 10 says, In the house of Israel I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's harlotry is there, and Israel has defiled itself. So how does God see Israel? Defiled. Remember Hosea? He married a wife. What happened to his wife? She became defiled, right? She went off after other men. God says, that's what happened with Israel. They've gone off and served other people, other individuals. And that's where we'll stop. Because verse 11 goes with the next chapter. Anything else anybody has or anything anybody wants to mention? Yes, sir. That he told that to the to the tribe of Judah only. Not to the not to the tribe of Israel. Yeah. All right. Let's have ourselves a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that you worked in our world, in our life, in our political systems, in our fertility systems, in our health systems, that you work everywhere, Father. We pray that you would help us remember that, that serving you and following you, Father, not only brings you glory, but it allows you to bless us and give us the things that we need. We pray for our country. We pray for our world. We pray for all those, Father, who are hurting in the world, who don't know you. We pray that you help us to be people that shed your light on them so that they might know you like we know you. We praise you and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.